Hello everyone, welcome back to the Fascinating Womanhood channel. On our channel, we talk about everything that has to do with developing femininity and building strong, long-lasting, loving relationships. I'm Cherry Lynn, and I'm here with my mom, Dixie and Ellen Forsyth. Hi. Hi. So we're excited to talk about the topic of 10 habits of highly feminine women today. Why are we talking about this today? Femininity, a lot of people, their first brush with that word, it's they think of looks, how you look. And, that, and it is important to look feminine, but... It isn't actually even the most important part of femininity. The most important part has to do with how you treat others, your attitude about others, how you interact with others and things like that. It's not just about how you look. Part of being a feminine woman is having that habit inside that just doesn't feel like you're you're putting on something. You're not working to be feminine. It's just natural. So these are our 10 tips for you. There's more than 10, but these are our 10 tips for you. And we're going to go through them pretty detailed. So the first one is embracing the art of gentle disclosure. That's your soft tone and your gentle approach to communication instead of going in there like a bull out of a chute. You're terribly direct in your questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be rude. this dang blasted thing for me what that means is considering the other person always in your conversation with them how what you say might affect them how they feel and it will naturally lead you to be more sensitive to them and what they may be meaning or intent it's the way you interact with people verbally let's just be honest the hardest part about this is when you're dealing with conflict or you're dealing with a difficult situation you may feel like you have every right to shout. Listen to me, you mangy groundhogs. Or yell at someone. You, you, and you very well may have a right to. But why is it important to choose to be more gentle? Well, for me, because uh, I get I get it. <laughs> I get conflict sometimes online and things like that. But one of the rules I've made for myself is don't ever talk to people, get after them personally. Don't ever accuse them personally. If you're talking about a subject, say fast name, womanhood, or anything else, don't don't go after them personally, calling them names or assuming that they are a hypocrite or things like that, that I'll put everybody on the defensive instantly. If you have done that to somebody, you there's no point in your conversation if you've alienated them. I think a lot of women think if there's a contentious situation going on, I need to be strong. I need to be loud. Why is it more? Why are you suggesting that she be more gentle, the women be more gentle? Well, I think there's there's that word gentle. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. It has nothing to do with being direct or being upfront or anything, but it's not accusatory. It's not it's it's not uh, you know kind of attacking that person personally, but it's you can be very direct and be, be very soft tone. You've always shouted how uh, being a doctor's wife was career enough. Oh, it is, darling. I didn't mean to sound as if I'm unhappy. I'm very happy, and you know that. You don't have to shout because when you do shout, you've lost the other person. They're not listening. I agree. And I think it's so easy to jump to the shouting or the yelling or the loudness. It's not even necessarily yelling, but just becoming loud. It's our it's our instinct. As Not everyone, of course, is the same. But a lot of us have this instinct that when turmoil is boiling, we get loud. And it isn't necessarily strength in some, there might be some exceptions to that, but I think for the most part, at least in my life, I have learned that I'm so much more influential when I am gentle. And the reason for that is, is because it's self-control and the louder you get, I don't know about you all, but the louder you try to get when you're trying to resolve something, whether it be an adult, a child, whatever, the easy slippery slope it is to lose self-control. And to me, that's the piece that so many of us are missing. If you can control your tone and your outbursts if for some it may be that point you are so much more influential but when when people it's a good point you brought up when people raise their voice or very exercised it's because of emotion they have strong emotion and so our tendency is to raise our voice as our as we become more anxious angry scared any of those things it's it's kind of a natural thing but when you realize going into it you can feel that rising in you and you realize, I do I want to actually have an impact on this person? I need, I need to deliberately not do that if I'm if I'm going to actually make 
any headway with talking to them or convincing them of my point of view about anything. If I do this, I'm going to lose them. So you can deliberately decide not to go with that once you understand it. The second one is cultivating an appreciation for the depths of others' character. I like this one. I mean, I like all of them, but this one particularly I like because it, it helps you to understand um, that you can look for character traits that are positive in another person. It's like treasure hunting, the good in people. And so the people that I know that I think are really bad are not that bad. So if you can treasure hunt and look for the good in some of the people that you either don't like or don't like you, that you just have treated you badly or something, if you can find some way to empathize how they might be feeling, it helps you to calm down and, and it gives you the opportunity to actually potentially make friends with them, to build bridges over that. If you, if you allow yourself to treasure hunt for good things about them. I think this one is really tough because it isn't always verbal. It's all internal. A lot of this is internal, not all of it, but a lot of this is internal because if you, it's so easy to see someone and see the mistakes. You can do that all day long. It's so easy. If you want to find something bad about somebody, it's easy. It's a little more challenging to see the good in everyone. And some people do it naturally. And I think it's really, I really admire yeah. it because it's not easy for all of us to see the good in people. I know that sounds kind of corny to be like, well, I'm always looking for the good in people, but it truly, truly is a wonderful character trait. And it, it's freeing to say to yourself, I need to look for the good, even if it's someone that has wronged you. It's so easy to take people for granted. It's so easy. This is tough. This is challenging to do, but you can practice it. And of course, in Fascinating Womanhood, we focus on our relationships with the men that we love uh, primarily, but it includes children, friends, everybody. But when you just take men, husbands, loves the love of our life, they will, because we're so different, the person that we love will always do things that is different than us that we could easily misunderstand. And what you said about intent is so key. If we can start looking for uh, my husband said this or did this. What did he intend? Was he trying to hurt me? Was he trying to help me? Was he distracted by something else? And I'm offended because he didn't hear what I said. Or so I think he just didn't care. So because if you if you can see your husband as his intent, unless he really does have bad intent, his intent was to do something that he thought would help you. It brings home something for you to eat that you don't like. And you think he knew I didn't like this, but his, what is his intent? you can appreciate it for what it is and not resent it. Right. And a lot of that comes from us ladies being at times, I'm guilty of this, being a little too sensitive. Am I being overly sensitive? Is this that big of a deal? Next one is exemplifying authentic nurturing qualities. So whether you're a physical mother or not, it's recognizing and exemplifying or nurturing the qualities in us that is, is mothering. And I don't mean telling people what to do. I mean, like we were talking about before, empathizing, that kind of nurturing quality that women usually have natural in us, some kind of uh, squash it down based on how they're raised. But whether you have actually ever had a baby or not, that's natural for women. When it comes to nurturing, men are nurturing too. How is this different from men being nurturing? With, why is this part of femininity when men are nurturing? Well, women, men can be nurturing, but they don't tend to do it as consistently. And as a group, they're not as sensitive to needs. Like I know Bob, his, uh, his whole profession is in psychology, but he does not notice things like when I say we're with a couple and I say, the wife... I can tell she looks really sad. Did you see that look on her face? No, he didn't even notice it. He he notices some things, but he doesn't notice anywhere near the amount that I do. Or And he doesn't always act on it. Like I'll say, like when you kids were growing up, I'll say, I'd say one of you kids was picking at their food. I wonder if they're feeling okay. He didn't even notice it. So how was the first day of school? It was Fine, I guess. I don't know. Ahem. Ah! -ah. ah. So, Riley, how was school? When it, when it comes to nurturing, it sounds like what you're saying is it doesn't really necessarily have to do with children. It has to do with your sensitivities to the feelings of others. And it may yeah. not even be feelings. It may even just be the situation that you are observing, such as, I don't know, an animal that is sick or... 
a situation that feels negative and you're you're in, in a way you're nurturing because you're you're sensitive and noticing that a situation is not peaceful or it is becoming contentious or something yeah. like that is what you're saying yeah and and things like okay it's it's winter time where we are it's cold outside and i'll notice somebody walking along on a cold day they don't look like they're wearing a very warm coat and i'll notice yeah. i said poor person is walking yeah. i think you have to walk for he probably wouldn't have even noticed him because he's on to task things he's thinking about what he needs to do and it's not that he doesn't care he hasn't noticed those things it's kind of built into me to notice all these things around me and so what we're saying is appreciate that in us we need that because women are really important to this world and our nurturing qualities are a very valuable and important part see my husband definitely will notice feelings of others and he will notice a child walking around outside without a coda. He's more of nurturing in that way. However, he may not notice if I am having a hard time. <laughs> you may have a guy in your life that doesn't fit under that same profile, but you still are more sensitive and more, more likely to be more sensitive. And you can actually grow this. You may be yeah. nurturing about your home. You may not have kids or animals. You may be nurturing about plants in your home. And that's something that I think my husband is not really very capable of because it's like you said, we are just naturally a little bit better at it. And, but why is this important to being feminine? Why, what if someone just says, and eh, I don't really care about my nurturing side. Why is this influential and important? Well, for one thing, it's uh, it's charming. It's, it's attractive and it's a great balance to men's lack of sensitivity to ours. Women who are mothers or behave motherly, not meaning tie your shoes and, eat everything on your plate is really if we didn't have it in this world we'd have a a pretty sad place it's we already have enough problems as it is so bringing that out in women is a part of our femininity it's a part of our charm i'm constantly amazed at my child my both of my kids schools all of the charity drives that we do they're almost entirely dominated by women we and men help and, and that's that's part of it but we dominate these charity drives we're the ones that want to put forth that service and we care. And I think that's another level of being nurturing is the service that you give to others in your community. And I'm not saying men don't do it. Of course they do it, but we yeah. are kind of pillars. We dominate of, it. Yeah, we dominate yeah, we it. We dominate it. And thank goodness we, we're we good at that because we can make such a big difference. So I think that's also another part of it for those that are watching that aren't mothers. So maybe you're not a mother and you probably can't or you won't be, but this is another part of it. And it's important that we recognize the strength inside of us and make you feel so much better knowing that this is something that you have as a strength as a woman. Well, women uh, women often also try to get laws changed to favor a relationship. Seems like somebody's child is killed and they'll pass a law. They'll try, they'll advocate passing a law to try and protect that from ever happening to someone again. And it's kind of why women, I mean, this is just my opinion in, in my own head. Women dominate the nursing industry. <laughs> They do. Nurses, nurses are dominated by that's a female dominated role. Of course, there's men that do it, but how many? I don't know. I could probably look it up what the percentage is, but it's because that's a very that's a much more nurturing role. I'm glad that we're good at it in that oh, way. Also, er, education, early childhood education, elementary school, and dominated, by women. dominated by women because there it requires kind of a nurturing personality to do it well. Right. Yeah. Okay, the fourth one is embodying grace through delicate movements. People who have good manners are polite, even in their presentation, the way they sit, the way they walk. It, it has an impression on people and it's polite. It's thoughtful. Has anyone ever had poor table manners around you and you know how that makes you feel? It's it's a part of femininity. Although I, I personally believe that you should develop the way you sit and move and eat and do it, whether you're all alone in your house or with people, because that's when it's really a habit. We have a lot of people that follow us on social media. And every time we post something about manners, we get a lot of comments that say people should just do whatever they want. You shouldn't tell them what to do. What's your answer to that? We're not telling them what to do. We're telling them what works. You know, they, the people that say that don't like it when people do it to them either. It's not, it's not a one-sided thing. Nobody likes it. Nobody likes it if people just just are, are really rude, crass, uh, burp loudly at the table. Nobody likes someone else doing it to them. Here's the thing I think that's also missing from those commenters is that the way that you, the mannerisms that you adapt and the way that you walk and move isn't just about how you look on the outside. It affects your mood. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I dress up, I feel different. 
Yeah, so you have more confidence. The same goes for when you're walking a certain way, moving a certain way, as you mentioned, eating a certain way, you feel different. You probably don't chew with your mouth wide open when you're in a business meeting for those of the women that work. You're not going to do that. Well, why? Why not? Well, because you could go through a various list of reasons why it's not appropriate, but you would feel bad about yourself. You'd have lower self-confidence. And th yeah. this one, I know traditionally this point is about what's on the outside. I get it. But it also ties into what, how you feel on the inside. And I think that's not being taught to our younger generation today. They're saying, go to school in your PJs and who cares, eat your snack in, in class and who cares if it falls all over the place. Like it, <laughs> there's, it's just not being taught. I know I instinctively years ago, because I, I was very, very shy growing up when I had to make an important phone call, especially if I had to confront somebody, I always made sure I got dressed up, even though they didn't see me, it was on the phone before I ever made the phone call because I was more confident. Right, right. Well, and I have to say too, those of us that want to work on number one, the point about having a gentler tone and being in self-control, this could potentially help you develop that habit if you are working on your delicacy and your delicate movements and how you delicately move and hold yourself and carry yourself. Exactly. The fifth one is mastering the subtleties of pure verbal artistry. Yeah, that's being polite in your tone, not swearing, taking other people into consideration, giving them benefit of the doubt where possible, uh, saying what as much as you can saying you're right about this. But if, you, if you're contradicting, you're right about this, but then have you considered that? Just your tone with other people, uh, your politeness, people that use really bad language, even politicians that not too many people like, <laughs> whatever side of the aisle they're on, they know that it's really bad if they use certain language over the mic. They get called on it. Well, people instinctively know that that kind of language isn't okay to say into a microphone, even though when the microphone's off, they use it all the time. I, I think it's better to speak the way if you whether a microphone is there or not, you speak the same way all the time. And you don't have a public tone where you use this language and another tone for people you actually care about. And you let the words fly. We did a video on this topic. This is a very deep topic, because I think I have a lot of empathy for those who are raised with bad language uh, and this isn't just about language this is also about the topics that you choose to to engage in conversation gossip i think that falls under this one as well that this is tough if you were raised in an environment where this is normal i get it i get it it's hard and you know you may even we're not raised with it but you may be exposed to it in your work environment mm -hmm. and it just becomes nothing and and i'm telling you it is not nothing you have no idea who you might be offending especially in this day and age it feels like you can blink and offend somebody it's 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 kind of it's kind of challenging <laughs> to navigate this world and the society and how, pe how sensitive people are and i think the this is just the abcs of of avoiding hurting people and, and part of that is swearing part of that is the topics that you engage in gossip talking about people behind their back that's all not that's not associated with being classy like you mentioned and that's what we're aiming for here is being more classy because a feminine woman has that self-control as we keep talking. That's kind of like the word of the video, self-control. You are more in control with yourself if you can cease from going towards that place. I'm glad you brought up topics because th there's so many hot topics today. There didn't used to be as much when I was growing up. I mean, there were hot topics then, but now there's so many and there's so many platforms in social media. It, it used to be that when you engaged in these conversations, you were in person or on the telephone and the telephone it's just, unless you have a party line, it was just two people talking. So, but topics uh, that you put, things that people post on their their Facebook pages or they put on Instagram, it it can offend, you can offend people so easily. So that's why in Fascinating Womanhood, we always say, unless you know the person well, don't talk about, don't talk about certain subjects. You know, we all kind of know what they are, unless you're positive or the other person's view as being the same as yours approach those things very carefully. This is something that is dying. We're not teaching our children this. I mean, the other day, I told you this, my son had a bullying incident in school. And when I went to resolve it with the teachers, they basically had to explain to the child that was bullying my son that what he was saying was was mean. And he didn't understand what he said to him was mean. And this is just an example with children, of course, it's not an adult and it's not also it's not females. But I think this is something that is being taught to our kids where we're, it's being part of normal. And yeah. when you start to recognize that, 
and realize this is supposed to be the new normal, but where are we going with this? What is this going to cause? It's going to cause a lot of contention. Well, some people misunderstand. They say you've got to be authentic. Authentic self does not mean you have no manners and no sensitivity to other people. And that that can be taken in a whole different direction. That isn't it doesn't work for civilization. When you feel more feminine and happy, you are you can handle the horrible things that happen in this world better. Right. Not perfect, but mm -hmm. better. Okay, the next one is nurturing the home as a domestic goddess. You know, it's kind of hard today. So many of us are working outside the home and it's hard to work outside the home and take care of everything in our home at the same time. It's a it's a lot, especially if you have small children. And the domestic goddess isn't just about a tidy home and it isn't just about meals, although those, those are included, but it's about the atmosphere in your home, that you atmosphere in your home actually has to be created every day. You don't start from scratch but you maintain it. Part of it is your attitude. Part of it is physically what things look like or things uh, basically tidy or uh, good smells. And is there is there laughter in your home? Is there positive kind of uh, where we kind of validate each other in our home? And women are the key to this because we are the nurturers. We're the gatekeepers of civilization. And we the reason we're key to it is because we are more clued into those things. We're multitaskers and we can we can keep our eye on this and this and this all at the same time. This one is really special and, and important to me because I really admire the women that, that can make their home this way. It's, it's It almost feels like magic to me when you walk into someone's home and you can tell that it's cared for. And like you said, it's not about being perfect. A perfect home is not what a, a domestic goddess is about. It's about a home that is is cared for and loved. And I think, you know, the people that probably all of you all that clicked on this video today, you want to learn how to be more feminine. Well, when I think of the ultimate feminine woman, I think that her house is going to feel a certain way. And everyone has their own style. My house doesn't feel the same as yours, but we care for our home. And you said the ultimate goal is that it, it's a welcoming place. And I've heard you say this so many times that your home should be a sanctuary. Your home should be a safe place that you can feel safe and not just physically safe, but emotionally safe. Yeah, and that's really important. If you serve an amazing dinner that you worked on all day, but dinner is filled with arguments and contention, well, it's kind of That's pointless, cool. right? Yeah. So it's about having that whole package and it's going to be a different goal for everyone. I have different goals domestically than you have. Everyone has their own goals. And some of us are not as domestic as others. And some of our men are more domestic than we are, mm -hmm. but you can still contribute to the, the domestic success in your home by making it a loved place. Yeah, my goal is... It's more unconscious than I ever really verbalize it much. My goal is when people come into our house, they feel like they can sit down and relax. And I want them to feel like, ah, oh, I can relax in here instead of I have to be on my absolute best behavior, one not one move wrong, or I'm going to feel like i got to get out of here. I like people to feel comfortable, welcomed. And I think so yeah. many women online think that a domestic goddess is wearing a 1950s apron and holding a pie. Well, it's, it's more than that. And the art of a domestic goddess is not about having a perfectly ha clean house at all times. Your refrigerator doesn't have anything out of place in it. None of your cupboards are out of place. It's good to be organized. My mother was like that. But the, the atmosphere in your home, atmosphere, is should be number one. And, and you're not going to have good atmosphere if you have chaos everywhere either. But having... Atmosphere number one, which is relationships again. That's the good thing that the thing that women do well is it's focusing on relationships. Where are people going to feel comfortable and welcomed here? Yeah. Number seven is possessing an, an innate understanding of men. Women are the only ones who really do this, can do this well. Now, a man can understand another man, but it's not quite the same. It doesn't mean the same to men. A person could say, well, they should understand us. And you'd be right. It's just that they don't tend to focus on that as much as we do, as quickly as we do. But when, when you can learn, studying that middle section of my book on understanding men, you can learn to understand men. And I mean the service people that come to your house, not just your husband or your boyfriend. I mean, men in general, they will feel happier and you will be better treated. You will be better thought of and you'll feel better about yourself. But it's a natural part of femininity that we've kind of lost, but we can relearn it. Why understand. is it important for a feminine woman to understand men? Why is that important? Well, because for one thing, then we'll stop competing with them. It doesn't do us it doesn't do us any good. And we live the way the world is now, 
femininity, I, I'm, it just constantly boggles my mind that a lot of women don't even know what femininity means. It's that lost to our, our sex. And, and part of that is, uh, part of the power of femininity is in understanding men. If, if all women, which isn't possible, but if all women understood men, uh, the world would be a better place. There'd be a lot more happiness and um, a lot less contention. If we understood our men better, we'd be less critical of them. We would let a lot of things go because we'd understand them. If you're married to a basically good guy, if you're married to a, a real criminal type, that's not true. Men are not understood. They, they get very little of it in the world and we, we can give it to them free. For me, understanding men, uh, in addition to what you just said, is so crucial to a feminine woman because it protects you from getting hurt as often. And I, as a sensitive woman that gets hurt, my feelings hurt um, often. When I can go back to what did he mean by that? What happened today? That's part of understanding men. When you can learn those things, it's not only going to help him kind of treasure you more and feel understood, but it's also the part I think a lot of women miss is it's going to protect you from feeling so hurt and those misunderstandings that happen all the time in relationships. And I've got to say a, a little known category of men that we sometimes leave out. It's really valuable is our sons, our boys. And some women don't realize that the fascinating womanhood principles are for our boys and what makes them tick and why they do what they do. You know, boys and, and your boy is not in high school yet, but there's, there's a lot of invalidation and, and, uh, with kids, especially boys as they get older. There's with girls in a different way, but boys are not encouraged to be masculine. And as mothers, we can encourage their masculinity and validate it and with our men as well as our sons. Yeah, and this isn't just for mothers, this is in your profession. If you are a woman in a, in a work setting and you understand your male coworkers, you are such a more valuable employee. This is this goes beyond to anything that you would be doing, wherever you would be working, in addition to your sons and your husbands and your brothers. So understanding men is very powerful. And if you can learn it just a little bit, even just the basics, it will make your life just so much more peaceful. Well, and for, for those of us women who want power, it makes you so much more powerful when you yeah. when you understand because there is power in femininity. We just it's just so sad how we don't we don't really understand it. Um, the next one is, this is number eight, radiating a joyful and resilient outlook. This one's harder, easier said than done. <laughs> it is, but yeah. being positive and communicating happiness and joy. Uh, all of us can do that naturally sometimes, but sometimes it's we're going through hard things and it's, and it's difficult. But if we can try and find what good there is in in any day there's always something good in in a day that you can that you can point to and say things you're grateful for this is a very internal battle for most of us not all of us i think some people are really good at this and just naturally show their happiness and you know those people in your life hopefully you know at least one you know that being around them is wonderful because they always are positive and i think a lot of people will say well i don't want to be fake and that's not the message here the message is not to be fake mm -hmm. the message the message is to genuinely try to be positive and i know that's so hard in this day that we're in right now but looking for that positivity and it, this kind of goes hand in hand with the one that we were talking about about um cultivating appreciation for others it's very similar although it's more about what's going on inside of you and looking for the good not only in you but in your life and that's that's pretty challenging to do for a lot of us i have to say there's there's a person here and there that are so focused on being positive that if you're going through something very difficult they won't allow you to really talk about it they have to Say, but aren't you grateful for this and aren't you grateful for that and it's it's sort of being uncomfortable but with being able to talk about something that's situation that someone's going through that's really hard so you can be an, an optimistic person and yet empathize with somebody who's lost a loved one or is worried about one of their children or a lost a job or something like that and you don't have to immediately go to but aren't you grateful for this and aren't you grateful for that it shows a lack of insensitivity right. if you can't empathize as a feminine woman, we don't want to be a Debbie Downer. And of course, you're going to have challenging situations in your life. The difference here is about dwelling and staying. Mm -hmm. and, and we talk about this in Fascinating Woman. We call this upstairs versus downstairs. And basically, if I had to rename this point for everyone that has read your book and is familiar, I would call this staying upstairs. A feminine woman is generally trying to be upstairs. We actually did a video. We can attach it about how to do this because this is a very in-depth topic. And a lot of it has to do with you taking the necessary steps to 
consciously try to be positive. And even if you aren't happy, you can still find things to be grateful for and, and express that gratitude in your daily lives. I think gratitude is kind of the key to having a resilient outlook is because there's always things to be genuinely grateful for. Right. And uh, there's a lot of them to be genuinely grateful for. And when you think about yourself and allow yourself to feel the gratitude, mm -hmm. it helps you to be able to handle other things better. The next one, number nine, is unveiling life's comedy through a discerning lens. I love this one. This one is something that you and dad are really good at. So I'm, I'm anxious to hear your tips on how to have more humor. We talk about funny things that happen in the family. Do you remember when this happened? We connect with those funny stories. We'll say, remember when this happened? They draw us closer together. Some of the things that happen that we hate, your most embarrassing moment, for example, a few years later become hilarious when you look back on it. Will I ever laugh again? Yes. When? When something is really, really funny. I can laugh about it even though it's been many years. Yeah, this takes so much practice. This is something that I really struggle with because I think, you know, I married a man who's a little bit more serious and it's harder for him to find the humor. And so sometimes I find myself that comes, that influences me. And so I think to myself, I've got to be the one to make things humorous because I grew up in a family like where we always laugh about everything. We, we try to look at everything with a, a sense of humor, not everything, but almost everything. We try to see it as a sense of humor. And if you have somebody in your life that you think is good at this, maybe that's your challenge as you just think, well, what would this person, how would they approach this? And what, what could potentially be humorous about this? And a part of this for me is watching things that are funny. Sometimes I have to say to my husband at night, if we're going to watch something together, I have to say, would you mind if we watch something that's funny? Because I had a really hard day and I don't think I can handle a drama. I don't think I can handle something serious. It may just be doing that. It's a skill, but it's a, something that we can learn better to do. It makes you more charming. And it's a, yeah. it's a habit that can be difficult to, to pick up if it's not natural to you, but it's, it's a great quality to try to have. Okay, and the last one is exemplifying a solid work ethic. My parents both were very good at this and I admired it, I'm particularly in my mother, because she was there all the time. My dad did too, but I took his more for granted. My mother, she had no problem if any of us were sick, and there were eight of us kids, she'd be up all night uh, giving us regular cough syrup or taking our temperature, and she never complained. And she didn't mind work. She didn't try to get out of work. So her work ethic was partly that she embraced work as something that made her feel good to accomplish things. A lot of feminine women get a very poor reputation, you know this, of being lazy. That You're so delicate and you're lazy and like that's kind of the goal is that you're this little fragile flower. And at Fascinating Womanhood, that is not what we teach mm -hmm. and that's not what we believe and that's not how we live. We believe that feminine women are hard workers and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're working outside the home or you're staying in the house. It's about how you perceive a job well done and making sure that you are goal oriented and how you perceive a uh, discipline of yourself. You know, a feminine woman is not a woman that sits at home all day and is lazy. She's getting things done. She's accomplishing things. And, and if you are someone that works outside the home, you take your job seriously with pride and you work hard and you don't neglect the things that you should be um, in charge of. And as a mother, like what you mentioned, you take your job as a mother seriously and you're dedicated to it. It's charming to have a good work ethic and you'll be respected and admired for it. There's a certain amount of life that is drudgery. And when you embrace it, just that part of life is, is this. And we don't complain about it because we're living on this earth and this is what's part of life is drudgery. Any job, no matter what it is, whether you're the president of something or a king or whatever it is, there's a certain amount of drudgery that has to be done in yeah. that in that calling. Things that you don't aren't very fun. There's a lot of things you have to do that is just work. Being a mother, there's tons of things we have to do that are not fun. There's tons of things that everybody has to do that are not fun. Actors, they have to sometimes. I heard one actress say, "I sitting around in my trailer for six hours waiting to be called to the set drove me crazy." And so you don't think about them having to sit and wait to be called and trying to memorize their lines and hours pass or working to, do, to, to get a scene done right for 12 hours and having 50 takes. Mm -hmm. Those things aren't fun. So if we can get used to accepting that there's a lot of things that we do that are not fun, but it's part of our character. Our character is part of our femininity. It's part of our self-esteem and it's mm -hmm. part of what makes us happy. 
I know a lot of women struggle with the work ethic part, especially if they are challenged with like mental problems. Like we we have a lot of ladies that that reach out to us and say, well, I have ADHD or I have ADD Mm -hmm. or I have a hard time or I have depression. I have a hard time being motivated. Mm -hmm. We actually did a a, a video about setting up your day that we can attach. But I think this doesn't necessarily apply if you're if you're going through some of those more medical Mm -hmm. Things I think those are areas where, I, and I feel for the women that reach out to us and ask us about this all the time, but I think this is where you need to get more with a health provider and someone that's more of a professional professional to help you with that. Yeah, I mean, I mean all of us, I'm, I've had several surgeries in my life. I can't always have the, do the things that I would yeah. be able to do today. I can't always do them. And, and there's times in your life where you had a loss, you're grieving, and you can't sure. always do everything perfectly nobody will but this whole video is about habits habits uh, of highly feminine women a habit isn't something you discard because you're sick right you get back to it. <laughs> yeah you get back to it as soon as you can if you're used to getting up at seven and you're sick and you stay in bed all day it doesn't mean you've ruined everything I hear women say well i'm on my it's that time of the month and i'm on my period and i have a hard time um, being feminine or whatever. <laughs> like, I, I just don't understand that. I, I, I empathize, but I don't, I don't fully understand that because I think, you know, this is part of who you are. And if you are turning on femininity and then you're turning it off because you don't feel well, like, that doesn't make sense. To me. Periods are feminine. <laughs> Men don't have that. Well, so- I get it. You're not going to have a strong of a work ethic naturally if you don't feel oh. I get it. But the point isn't to give up. The point is to push through. And I know that it's hard. I understand breastfeeding in the middle of the night, being up all night is hard. Um, b- working 14 hour days is hard. I've had jobs where I've had to work all night. It's hard. I understand that it's hard and I empathize, but having a good attitude and pushing through is the message here. I think it's just trying your best. Just doing the best yeah, thing. Trying your best and realize that you can improve yourself and you can be happier. You can have better relationships. You can be in touch with your femininity and it will give you a sense of power. Highly feminine women are women that have a lot of influence. And that's what we're wanting for you. Well, that's our list. Thanks so much for sticking around with us for this a little bit longer video today. I hope you enjoyed it. And let us know your comments down below so that we know that you're watching. We're here most of the time on YouTube. So we love to hear your comments and topics that you'd like to hear from us. Maybe there's something we talked about today that you'd like us to dive a little bit deeper into. Let us know in the comment section. And we would so much appreciate you subscribing to our channel so that we know that you're here and we know that you're watching. Thank you so much for being with us, Dixie. And thank you for all of your valuable input today. If you haven't bought Dixie's book, Fascinating Woman for the Timeless Woman, I'm ta- attaching a link where you can find that book. You definitely need to read it if you want to learn more about everything that we talked about today. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.